I'm Dr. Nick Gowland, Business Development Manager at the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre, and you're watching the Challenges and Opportunities webinar from the University of Manchester. In today's webinar, we'll hear from James Baker, CEO of Graphene at Manchester. James will be telling us all about the Manchester model of innovation, which he has implemented at the Geek. He'll discuss how the Graphene at Manchester ecosystem aims to bring together the right people, from inventors to academics to supply chain and end users, to take great ideas and rapidly accelerate them into real world applications. And James is going to present today on the, the Manchester model of innovation, as, as he calls it. So I'll hand over to you, James. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Nick, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, pleasure to be here um, on Zoom talking to you all this week. Gosh, times are very di different. This week, I've done a conference in Abu Dhabi, a conference in what would have been Coventry, and now, I guess, what would have been in Manchester, all within a couple of days. So pretty unprecedented around the you know, various reach. So welcome to those from just looking at some of the comments from, from again, an international audience. So I'm going to talk today about what we're now starting to call the Manchester model of innovation. So it's very much a story or a narrative around graphene and 2D materials. But for me, it's not just about 2D materials. It's probably the broader advanced materials opportunity. And it's also something not just about technology. It's about how we're also approaching the development of what I would call the ecosystem, the business model, the process of taking a new invention from the lab into the marketplace. So from Nick's introduction, I'm part of the University of Manchester, but I'm not an academic. So I'm not responsible for any of the teaching or the research, but more around how through partnership and collaboration can we take graphene and 2D materials into products and applications and to create value. And maybe just a little bit of context to this is that I'm sure most, if not all of you have heard the story, 2004, the two scientists driven by curiosity, took the graphite, the sticky tape, peel that many times to isolate a single atomic layer of carbon. So what? They then went on to receive the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010 um, in recognition for not just the discovery or isolation of graphene, but as a 2D material, graphene had these unique um, and discriminating properties sometimes called the wonder material. And you probably heard things like 200 times stronger than steel, more conductive than copper, um, stretchable, bendable, transparent, um, and also can act as a perfect membrane. So great science took place, and that was recognized by the Nobel Prize in 2010. But anyone who's been involved in advanced materials from history has come across a whole series of challenges, not just on the science, but in terms of translating that science from the lab into products and applications. And around 2010, for me, the journey probably started around commercialization and the then Lord um, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, George um, Osborne, sort of came up with a phrase of how we, can we convert discovered in Britain into made in Britain? And that was really a recognition that in the past, probably the UK had a great reputation for science, but not always the greatest reputation for creating supply chain, creating product, creating value and creating job. So today the Manchester model is less about the science, more about how do we convert that science into value to create jobs, to create product, to create the whole supply chain going forward. But it's not easy for those who have been involved and in from history, whether it is things like carbon black, Kevlar, or from my background, we often talk about carbon fiber. Carbon fiber first discovered through to first products in the marketplace was probably 25 to 30 years. And then we were talking about sporting goods, Formula One, aerospace. And today carbon fiber is probably 60 years old and it's now quite widely adopted in aerospace, but it's still taking some time to get into automotive or into the broader supply chain. So a whole series of issues around that, from about radical new materials that customers or, or companies are risk averse, 
through to some of these benefits being quite significantly upstream, no supply chain in place. So quite a few things have to be addressed if you're going to take a new material into the marketplace. And a chart I've often used to describe that is one of technology readiness level or TRL, but a second axis of system readiness level or SRL. And in very simple terms, what we have to do is to go from the bottom left hand side, so low TRL, low SRL, <coughs> which typically is in academia, through to the top right of the chart, high TRL and high system readiness level. And that journey can typically take many tens of years from the start of the discovery through into the marketplace. So going back a number of years at Manchester, we created what we now call Graphene at Manchester. And as I said earlier, Graphene at Manchester isn't an academic activity. It's really an organization that was set up to accelerate the commercialization of graphene and 2D material. But it's very much a collaboration and partnership model, but it works with small businesses, large corporations, startups and spin outs. But in essence, it's about bringing together that ecosystem of people from academia, from industry, together with world class facilities, capabilities, and equipment. And it's all about this creation of supply chain to create products and applications. But a lot of challenges in doing that. Anyone who's been involved in a new material or involved in taking material from the lab to the marketplace will find some of these challenges. From how do you bring together academia? How do we get the physicists talking to the material scientists, to the engineers? How do we actually make the material not at gram level, but at kilogram or ton level? How do we do that? in a more agile way that doesn't take a cycle of three or four years to go through each of the TRLs? And how do we also address things like standards, measurement, characterization? All of these are quite key if you're going to take a new material into the marketplace and need to be addressed if you do that on a rapid scale. So one of the things we often talk about with graphene is since 2004 to today, it's still a teenager. 16 years since that first discovery through to today is still relatively young as a new material. But one of the challenges we have, if we're gonna drive productivity, gonna drive jobs, drive um, discrimination, we need to do that in a much more rapid time scale in the future. So this story today is, is much about that journey, but how do we accelerate new materials, whether it's graphene, 2D materials, or advanced materials, from the great work that's taking place in academic institutions, and particularly around Manchester, but how do we take that into product and application? So the first stage of our journey was the creation of the National Graphene Institute. 60 million pound of funding through UK government, Engineering Physical Science Research Council, 38 million pounds, and with the addition of 23 million pounds from the EU, from um, uh, European Union, to make a 61 million pound National Graphene Institute. For me, <coughs> it was the first step in this journey. What it created though was world-class facilities, clean rooms, equipment and facility, not just for graphene, but for this whole 2D family of materials. So the NGI was a key first step in this journey. It brought together the multidisciplinary research from across the university. It enabled the world-class bringing together under class 100, class 1000 clean room conditions, for example, to really promote and accelerate the research around not just graphene, but the family of 2D materials. And again, not gonna to talk too much around it today, but not only are we talking about graphene, today there are over 100 other 2D materials and we're now looking at multifunctional uh, structures, uh, heterostructures, layered materials, what I often refer to as graphenes. So we're now not just talking about one material, but different types and different um, structures, if you like, Lego bricks of 2D materials. 
So the NGI has been quite key in a significant number of outputs from a number of researchers. So today we talk around 300 plus researchers across the University of Manchester. That's driven significant publications from nature and science through to the creation of patents, through to number of citations and research groups across the University of Manchester. Not only do we have the NGI, we also have the Sir Henry Royce Advanced Materials Institute, but significant investment in infrastructure, equipment, facility, and that academic base of the science, um, really key if you're gonna take the technology forward for commercialization. As well as the science piece, the NGI started bringing together industrial collaborations. And to date, since 2004, we've now worked with over 150 industries working on projects, working on collaborations, working on PhDs or sponsoring activity associated with graphene and 2D materials. But we've also worked with companies like the National or Institutes like the National Physical Laboratory in the development of standards. If you're gonna commercialize a new material, standards, quality control, measurement characterization are very critical. And in the early days, we formed a partnership with MPL, working with British Standards, ISO, and the EU around the development of standards. And again, just a couple of examples here around standards, but also good practice guides that were produced in 2018 that have really helped, I believe, um, industry get their understanding of what graphene is, what it isn't, what's important, and how we actually might take this material forward in the various products and applications. So the NGI has been a key first step in that innovation cycle in what we call in the Manchester model. But we also needed to look about the whole innovation cycle. Why does it take us months, if not years, to take something from the lab into the marketplace? A colleague at the University of Manchester, who's famous um, for his role both in the university, but also as the CTO of the Royce Institute, Professor um, Withers, Phil Withers, often refers TRL a bit like a game of snakes and ladders. You can do a lot of work in the lab, you try and take it into the factory, you find it doesn't work, so you go back down the snake or the TRL um, chain back to a lower TRL. And if that cycle is taking you months and years, it can take many years to go from that lab through what's traditionally called the valley of death from academia into industry and in the factories. So we were fortunate at Manchester that in addition to the 61 million pound um, uh, National Graphene Institute, we received a further opportunity for an additional 60 million pound funding to build what we now call the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre or the GEEK. But key to the GEEK was it needed to occupy this space of TRLs three to six, but it also needed a model that could do that probably differently than we traditionally have done. How do we go into scale up pilot production and do that measured in days and weeks rather than measured in months and, and years? And key to that for me was this innovation cycle you see here, which is a problem led or challenge led system. So industry led research rather than an academic or technology push, but looks at the problem, comes up with a design that might be supported by all the research um, across the University of Manchester and beyond. It might also involve design from our partners in terms of understanding a problem or a challenge. Going forward, increasingly, it might also include uh, modeling or artificial intelligence or what's commonly called made smarter. So the use of AI in terms of manufacturing or design philosophy. How do we do that design, make something, test it, fail and fail fast if it's gonna fail or succeed and then iterate that very quickly to try and reduce that whole innovation cycle. So this whole concept of make or break or fail fast, again, is quite fundamental around the model that we're trying to create around the geek and hopefully more agile and move in terms of weeks and months as opposed to months and years. And that's something that particularly we're trying to implement now 
with the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre. So the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre is a £60 million facility. It's in partnership with um, Abu Dhabi and the Mazda um, uh, Renewable Energy Company. So it opened at the end of 2018, 60 million pound of which 30 million comes from Mazda and 30 million pound comes from UK government and from Europe. So again, a significant investment, 121 million pound in the NGI and the Geek, coupled with a significant investment over 200 million in the Advanced Materials Royce Institute. So significant investment in infrastructure. Unlike the NGI, which is more about clean rooms and more of the fundamental science, the Geek is more about pilot production and scale up. So a very different feel and look to the Geek. And I often describe it as making things measured by the kilogram or by the meter squared. It is not a production facility, but it can do things at a scale that is more representative of a factory or a scale up. So we're not into continuous production, but we are looking at doing batch runs at the kilo or the meter squared type of, of measurement. And again, on these two pictures, you saw one of our labs. And here is our high bay where we can do everything from uh, laying up a carbon fiber through to metal matrices, through to some actually kit in there at the moment from the Royce, looking at um, stamping material and additive manufacture. So very much a modular type of approach, but you'll see from the height of the ceiling, the, the cranes, it can deal with fairly large industrial type of equipment and machinery. So what does the GEEK do? Aligned with the National Graphing Institute and our schools, we are looking at everything from material production, that's both top down and bottom up. So we're looking at things like CVD processes, as well as, as, as um, um, platelets. But again, whilst we can make material, the intent of the geek is never to be a material supply chain. What we really want are partners who actually can make material by the gram, by the kilogram, or by the ton, because if we're gonna take graphing forward, we need that supply chain to be in place. But we need the ability to develop new materials, and a good example there is the work we're doing around CVD. Can we actually develop new forms or new processes around top-down processes that also, sorry, bottom-up processes, but not just for graphene, but maybe other 2D materials as well. So the Geek can make material, but it's more about application. And we have labs around composites. So that's everything from rubbers through to plastics, through to carbon fiber, as well as metal matrices. We then have printed electronics, so everything from sensors through to RFID, through to um, wearable technology. Energy around batteries, supercapacitors, energy storage, the membranes and coatings from desalination through to anti-corrosion coatings. Again, quite a broad range of activities involved in the GEEK. Core to the make and break is measurement. So we have our own measurement characterization capability, but that is also complemented by the broader capability across the University of Manchester, as well as our partners, for example, in NPL. So the Geek has got a fairly broad capability, but there's also quite a bit of what I would call integration capability. You might make, for example, if you're doing a new form of supercapacitor or battery, you might need to make a new case in the composite lab. You might need to make a, me a membrane or a coating onto a substrate. And you might want to integrate that into a battery or a supercapacitor and the ability to measure it. So again, the Geek is quite unique about being able to do those various activities. But it's also got space where partners can be based there. And it's also got space where we can move kit around and we can expand or we can change in the future. So just summarizing what we brought together in terms of, of um, capability and in terms of facilities, this is a chart I used earlier with TRL on the bottom with system readiness level. Core to what we continue to do remains in the university. So the academics doing new research, doing new papers, new publications, 
beyond graphene into 2D materials and heterostructures remains core to what we look at at the University of Manchester. The NGI has moved us further up that TRL into what I would call concept development, into prototype, into a lab-based demonstrator. And it's started to address things like standards, process yield, and partnership with industry. And today, industry can continue to support PhDs, can work around fundamental or more basic research, as well as if we have something that fails, sometimes that might actually open for a whole new area of research that is interesting for, for the researchers to look at. So a good example might be, for example, when we start adding graphene into concrete and we might start to get cracks, for example, do we really understand the nature of that cracks and that might form a sponsorship of a PhD or the sponsorship of a research program that we might submit into EPSRC. So the colleague of the geek, we have Professor Bill Sampson, and Bill Sampson in particular is really looking about how we build those links between the geek and the NGI and the broader schools and how we make sure that we actually get that academic, um, I call it goodness in everything we do, but also how we get that feedback from industry in terms of challenges that might form future research or future challenges going forward. So NGI is a key part of that. The geek fits very much in what I refer to as the valley of death, this gap between a prototype and pilot production. And then core to all of this is our partnership with industry. So this is what I start to refer to as the ecosystem and it includes people who make graphene, so people who can make graphene by the gram, by the kilo, by the ton, people who can make it by the meter squared. It includes people who might mix that graphene into a polymer or into a, into a prepreg or into, a, 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 um, into a, an ink, as an example. But it also includes bringing in end users, whether that's people from the aerospace sector, from the infrastructure or roads, from the energy sector or from um, the general public who might want um, an application um, involving graphene or 2D materials. So the ecosystem for me is a key part of what I call the Manchester model. But I'm gonna go on to later, it's not just the academics and the industry. We also work, and a number of people on this call today, with everything from IP lawyers through to marketing companies, through to trade associations, because what we really want to create is this ecosystem of people and capability and people talking together that can exploit and, and take advantage of graphene and 2D material products and applications. And as partners to the Geek, we have now in addition, we have seven what we call tier one partners. And again, the number of those are on the call today. That's everything from graphene manufacturers through to spin out companies, through to aerospace, through to steel, through to optoelectronics. So welcome to our partners who are here as tier one. We also have a number of what we call tier two partners. And again, quite interesting as a model, we've developed a framework contract that's, that's similar to the catapult model in the UK, but it's really been designed so that we can move quickly, either do a quick project and move on to a follow on project, or we can sign up either one, two, three or more projects very quickly and do that rather than take the weeks or months that it traditionally takes to negotiate an IP term or a contract uh, with the various sets of lawyers. So it's still quite early days, but we've now signed a number of partners and we have a number of partners in the pipeline for signing going forward. And as well as tier two, we have a number of project partners. As I said earlier, we also have a number of project, uh, what we call affiliate partners. So welcome to those on the call. And also we have something called a foundation partner, building that network of organizations to take innovation forward. A key part of our strategy was also around working with small businesses or SMEs. Um, actually some of our tier one and tier two partners are SMEs, which is really important and key to see. But we also have a specific program, again, leveraging European funding to work with small and medium enterprises based in Greater Manchester. Part of our Manchester model is also just not about science, but creating supply chain of companies that I have a presence in the geek or at the university, 
but also companies who have a presence both manufacturing in the greater Manchester area, not just the centre of Manchester, but in the local authority in the northwest. It doesn't have to be in Manchester, but we want a focus of companies who take advantage of that in Greater Manchester. And on the Geek, on Bridging the Gap, we have now working, as you'll see from this chart, with a number of SMEs. And again, quite interesting, going from quite a large number who we identified as potential through to actually filtering those down to ones who we might work with, through to today we're working with around 70 Greater Manchester-based small businesses and we actually have active programmes with over 30 of them. Another key part of that is also startups. Some of these are also working on the Bridging the Gap programme, but we have competitions like the Eli Harari Award, if you've been following social media. Eli Harari from Sandis fame sponsors an annual competition. And every year we have a winner and a runner up who um, uh, create organisations or businesses. And again, the Geek and the University support a number of those. We also last year held the Graphene Hackathon. Again, that's resulted in a number of startups and spin outs. And I'll talk about it later, the key part of the Manchester model. We're currently looking about creating an organisation that can bring investment and funding to these startups and investments that might also accelerate. And again, part of our relationship with Mazda and Abu Dhabi is also the potential for investment that might come from Abu Dhabi. For those who follow the Manchester story, will note that Abu Dhabi, as well as investing in graphene, also put some fairly significant investment into Manchester City and housing, and are looking at other potential investment opportunities in the future. So what are the opportunities um, for graphene? So some of this I'm sure you'll know. I just wanted to give just a few quick case studies and a few stories. Many of them are around Manchester, but they're not all about Manchester. For me, the Manchester model is not trying to own everything. We actually want to facilitate innovation, not just in Manchester, but across the world. That really started in 2004 and with a Nobel Prize. You know, there is no patent for graphene. The papers were published. I think the speed that graphene is moving is really because of that open innovation approach that Andre and Kostya applied to, to that discovery and that research. And for me, this is about promoting research, not just in Manchester, but across the globe. But clearly, we want to add value to our partners, to Manchester and to the university by creating both that science, but also that value in terms of products and applications. So for me, one of the big areas and particularly interesting for our partner in Mazda, but also with some of the global challenges around the world, UK is looking to go carbon neutral by 2050. Manchester has set a more aggressive target by 2038. So to achieve that, energy storage will be one of those areas where we need to do something quite radical and different. So this is everything from new battery forms through to supercapacitors. But it also includes, for example, you know, new forms of, of, of engines for cars or, for, or for, for aircraft. So the aircraft example at the moment that's in the news is around a hydrogen or a hydrogen electric hybrid, quite challenging by 2035. But to achieve that, we'll need new forms of material for, for storing the hydrogen through to converting it, through to transporting it. In cars, it's not just about energy management, also includes things like light weighting, new materials, lighting, more efficient thermal management. And again, not a battery example, but a good example around thermal management is a program of work that Ford did in America. Again, we weren't involved in this, but we are now talking with Ford around how they added graphene into the foam um, that goes into their engine bay. And you'll see from this chart that by doing that, they had some significant benefits in terms of the performance, in terms of weight, thermal efficiency and noise by adding graphene into the, into the um, uh, components. So we're not always talking about the new disruptive technology. We're also talking about adding graphene into things to make a significant difference. If you look at those benefits, double digit in three areas, that significant competitive advantage or performance advantage that Ford have achieved by adding a very small amount of graphene into just one of their materials in the Ford motor car. So that builds also onto light weighting. 
So for me, that's another example of lightweighting. But again, going back to aircraft of 2035, carbon neutral. Uh, I think it was launched this week about having a, a carbon zero flight um, across the Atlantic by 2035. You know, as well as new energy storage like hydrogen or batteries, they also need to look about new forms of material to take weight out of the structure, the wings. And again, there's some very interesting work around everything from lightweighting through to thermal management, through to lightning strike protection in aircraft. Quite a risk averse area, but already we've actually flown a graphene UAV, um, unmanned vehicle, a drone. We're working with a bid with one of our partners around creating a new um, UAV zone in the Northwest. And again, it'd be great if we could actually paint graphene being a key element in terms of our future UAV or aerospace strategy. And again, not an aerospace example, but one of our partners working with another of our partners, Haydale, have done some significant work around lightweighting for a sporting car application. And you can actually buy one of these cars if you've got quite a few pounds. But again, it's a great example of rapid pull for an exploitation. And again, you can see some of the benefits from, from doing that on this chart. One of the most exciting areas I see actually is reinforcement going forward. Going back to carbon neutral, smart cities, and, and maybe post COVID, everything from roads through to concrete, through to infrastructure. If we can add graphene into um, uh, concrete as an example, can we really play a key role in terms of construction, in terms of improving pro productivity, in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of reducing the amount of material, reducing the CO2 footprint? So again, some quite exciting examples. And again, just one case study I'll talk about is not concrete, but one of our partners who's actually a, a startup is looking about taking the problem of waste tires and how do you actually currently recycle a waste tire because today if you try and recycle a waste tire you lose a lot of the performance of the rubber and you can also create a problem with small beads of, of rubber that cause contamination so a small sme there's a spin out from the university called space blue has developed a solution called space mat which is a graphene enhanced rubber mat so adding a small amount of graphene to recycled rubber, a little bit of fresh rubber, they can come up with a, a, a rubber mat that has performance, it doesn't shred. And again, some quite interesting applications that if we can recycle that, rather than shipping waste tires or burning waste tires, we can reduce CO2 footprint from transporting, we can reduce pollution, and we can also start getting more towards a, site, a circle economy. And again, the latest Eli Harari Award, if people were watching it, the runner-up was something called Graphene Green Concrete. It was looking about taking um, recycled aggregates, adding graphene to use on our road network. And one of our partners is Highways England, and they're looking at real novel ways of taking graphene into the road network for everything from roads through to signs through to fencing. And again, it's a real exciting opportunity to pull through that technology. One final one, for me, one of the exciting one. So there's a mix of what I call linear innovation, so an improvement, but there's also some potential real disruptive opportunities. So filtration and separ separation is one of those, and membrane technology. There's some great research in terms of membrane technology, using a graphene membrane, for example, to separate clean drinking water from dirty, salty water. Some great research and great papers a really big challenge, but if we can scale that up, some real great opportunity around membranes and separation, maybe nearer term, we're probably looking around more simple things, maybe it's around uh, separating oil from uh, uh, water from, out, uh, from fuel, for example, for aerospace, or it might be a, a simple coating or an anti-corrosion coating might be the nearer term solution. But if we can really get a graphene membrane and we can scale up, here's an example of one of the projects we have with one of our partners we are looking to scale. It's a handheld device. And again, I know it very well. I took one of these out to America a year ago. And in, the, um, in Capitol Hill in America, we did a live demo of taking the color out of whiskey. It was a bit of fun. We still do fun Fridays in the NGI across the university. But if we can take the color out of whiskey, 
what else could we separate from a, a particular solution um, going forward? So again, it's a serious program. And if we can deliver that program, maybe one of the very early scale up of a, of a membrane or a filter application. And there could be many, many more I could have given today from thermal management to wearables, to electronics, to, to connectivity and 5G. So huge opportunity. And I think they'll see new areas um, and increasing areas, for example, medical increase in prominence in, in the future. So to summarize for me, the Manchester model is very much around what I call the ecosystem. It's founded on the science at the University of Manchester. The National Graphene Institute is a key facility in that early acceleration and bringing together the collaboration and the early creation of supply chain. The geek is around that valley of death, that make or break, that business model about fail fast, bring together the partners and the supply chain. And core to that is our partnership and collaboration with industry. Before I left, though, I just wanted to finish the last slide. I think I've just got time just to talk about post COVID, just to give a few reflections on what's been happening. I mean, first of all, I can't believe what we've achieved in the last four months in terms of collaboration, webinars, and my thanks to Nick and to um, Alan from the Geek team in particular who have, have, have run this webinar series, but also people on this call who have supported that, who have attended these have run their own webinars. For me, it's been a great opportunity to accelerate the understanding of what graphene is, what graphene isn't, what the opportunity is, what the applications. As I was joking earlier, I've done a presentation in Abu Dhabi this week, not physically, but in Abu Dhabi. I've done one what would have been in Birmingham at the Advanced Materials Show, and I've done this one today. So normally, physically could not have done all that activity. But just a few observations for me, post-COVID in terms of supply chain. So personal observations, just points that I'd just like to make to, to lead us into the Q&A. I mean, first of all, status of companies. A lot of companies out there have been really challenged. As a business, if I use that, the geek has been three months without being able to use our laboratories. We're now back in laboratories. We now have about 20, up to 25 people in all of our laboratories. So our laboratories are open, but people like myself are still working from home. So that's been a key milestone about reopening our laboratories. But our graphing supply chain have also had real challenges in terms of we've not been able to access buildings to make material. You know, a number of them have continued, which has been great to see. But there's a lot of disruption, not just in the material supply chain, but in the whole supply chain and end users. So again, that's a key issue we need to be aware of you know, in terms of cash flow, in terms of the ability to survive going forward. And some sectors are at difference. You know, aerospace, we've touched a bit today. You know, clearly, there are big job losses going across aerospace. People aren't flying. People aren't buying new aircraft. But is that an opportunity or is it a risk? Clearly, it's a risk if you've got a current project in aerospace or an engine or an activity flying today, because that engine or that aircraft is going to be flying less, need less maintenance, less repair, less new parts, less new aircraft. But if it's around a new aircraft, like a hydrogen or a, a um, hybrid electric solution, I think advanced materials could see this as an opportunity. Again, we're in dialogue with partners like GKN, Airbus and Kinetic, BAE, around how can we really disrupt with advanced materials. But my adage is if we behave like we've always done in the past in the aerospace sector, and we want to get a electric hydrogen aircraft flying by 2035, we probably should have started 20 years ago. So we need to start thinking differently. We need to do innovation differently. We need to embrace SMEs. And there's a number of papers going into government at the moment around this whole theme, around doing things that are going to be differently, leveling up, and how we engage with SMEs and innovation cycles, what I'll refer to later as the ARPA type of model. We're also seeing different status of companies depending on the country they come from. One of our partners is in Brazil, which has uh, got some real challenges over, over COVID. But I'm pleased to say that we're doing some great work with that partner 
and we have some early wins and hope you'll hear more about those in the near future. And we also have partners from China. Again, we're talking to them earlier today. And again, later this week, you'll see some press coming out around some of the work we've done, done with them over the last year. I'm pleased to say we're also getting some new innovation partners. Again, this has been one of the most positives for me that despite lockdown, despite not being at the Geek for the last few months, we're getting a number of new partners that we continue to sign up and we hope to be making new announcements about additional partners signed up, signed up very shortly. And we've even got one partner who from first dialogue through today is probably about four to six weeks. And if that goes well, we actually plan to launch the first product within the Q1 of next year. Talking to one of our existing partners today, from first dialogue through to the product being in the marketplace was seven months. So again, we really are starting to see some of those very early success examples of bringing product to market. I also think you're gonna see some opportunities going forward around what I would call sovereign capability or supply chain. And that probably leads to areas like defense. And I think we'll see some good opportunities. And going back to the rubber example and concrete, I think sustainability will be a key differentiator going forward. And again, I believe graphene and 2D materials can play a key role there, particularly if we look at sustainable graphene and the ways we produce it, and particularly if we can enable this recycling opportunity that I talked earlier with concrete and rubber, I think that could play very heavily into future investment opportunities. In terms of our business model, key on my mind is keeping our operations effective, keeping our labs open against what might often refer to as this second wave. I think it's also about how we work with large companies and small companies. Some of the larger companies arguably have more um, redundancy or more flexibility within their models, SMEs, and we maybe need to be create more creative around our tier two model as an example and the use of the geek facilities. We have to charge for them because of state aid, because of our funding, but how can we creatively develop our innovation model to embrace SMEs, to engage and to use the facility is something we're looking at. And that's where our framework comes in of tier one and tier two um, membership. We have our Bridging the Gap program and we're looking to extend that. Um, and that's something that I believe has been a great success. And we want to increase the alignment of that with all of our partners. And earlier, I also mentioned things like the Eli Harari and Graphene Hackathon. We really want to create this pipeline of, of students, of innovations, and ideas. I've been involved in Eli Harari now for six years. I think the first year we had one entrant. I think uh, this year there were 11 entrants, six finalists, and all of the six finalists could have won the award. They all had some really good bits. And in the end, it was selecting you know, the two we felt were most appropriate for the award criteria. But we are actually looking to work with all six of those finalists and actually some of the other ones as well. So look out and watch this space, everything from sensors um, for, um, for sleeping, through to green concrete, through to water treatment, through to a potential pandemic sensor uh, for the future. So some really interesting areas, as well as some really established ones like infrared, um, Harry Potter's cloaking mask you'll see, I may have seen about, through to um, novel new sensors. So some really interesting opportunities coming out of that. I touched on earlier about investment. It's a little bit early, so I can't say too much, but we're working with what we're going to call Manchester Graphing Company, which is a public-private partnership that we're looking to launch around bringing investment to SMEs and to startups. And for me, that's a really exciting opportunity that will bring even more acceleration to this whole supply chain and innovation not just in Manchester, but across the UK. And I mentioned earlier this whole political agenda around levelling up. In two weeks time, we have our first post lockdown visit from a VIP and we have a minister visiting the geek in a couple of weeks time. And we're very much firmly in the agenda around what's been called levelling up, which is around innovation models. It's around bringing together the technology around advanced materials, around investment, around the broader Innovation District Manchester and another thing that we're looking at around Manchester called the Manchester Manufacturing Innovation Park. So this is the potential for catapult-like organisation in the Greater Manchester area. So again you'll hear more about that in the future 
but it's all about joining these dots into this, this bigger picture. So this time to finally finish, I think I've used all my time up, but there's a little bit of time for questions. In the past, I've talked about the tipping point. There was an argument that said that COVID could have delayed the tipping point and we could have lost four or five months. Companies could have gone um, broke, you know, not, no appetite to invest in new materials. Whilst I still think we've got challenges, I see real opportunity now to invest in graphene and 2D materials. Some of those returns can be near term. I've touched on a few of them today. Product on the marketplace today within 16 years. So we're already 10 years ahead of carbon fiber, arguably. So you're seeing real products in the marketplace. But the next 12, 18 months, I think we're really going to start to approach that acceleration and what I would call the tipping point. So I'll finish on that point. And for me, I use this term of graphene city, the ecosystem, the Manchester model, the supply chain, the whole way of working with our partners. But thank you for listening. I hope you found that informative. And I'd like to open now for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, any questions, anyone? Please unmute yourselves or put your hand up or write it in the chat. While waiting for questions, James, I just thought I'd mention, you may have mentioned it, but I don't think I heard it, is do you want to quickly just touch upon the IP element of, of the Manchester model? I think that's quite a key bit of what we offer, is the kind of IP side of things, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. So, so on intellectual property, um, so there's several parts of the model. If it's fundamental research and, and base research, then the university generally follows its traditional model of looking to own that IP. And earlier you saw you have a patent family, around 50 patent families of, of IP. For the geek, we adopted a very different model that as we're in this translational research, for me, it's more important that industry both owns that research, but also protects it. So a model around the geek, the tier one and the tier two partnership is that we allow partners to own the intellectual property of any foreground that's produced on that product for a particular scope uh, or field of use um, for that project. What the university looks for though, is almost a success fee, a royalty, based on a percentage of the graphene element of that product. So why are we doing that? We want to get some return um, from projects. So running the facility, we're looking to cover our costs. We don't want to be a burden on the university. You know, the universities are principally set up for teaching and research. So we want the geek to cover its operational costs from project costs. But we also want to receive some royalty or some revenue in the future that we can reinvest into the geek, into equipment, but also into teaching and training and students in the future. So for me, it's quite a creative model. It's a framework contract. I think we are learning as we go along, but all our partners have signed up to it. It generally takes a few dialogues, but have GKN to have um, um, Airbus, to have Kinetic, um, all sign up to that as big corporations with, with very large legal departments for me, is a, a key success. Our record today, I won't say which company it was, was to sign that in one hour. And um, we've had a couple have signed it in a day, but more typically it takes us a week, two weeks to agree that. But anyone who's been involved in the university doing an IP clause in the past, I would say probably the average of discussing a contract and IP clause is anything from six months to nine months. So it's not just innovation in what we do, it's also innovation in the business model and the way we contract is something that we're looking to do. Yeah, cheers, James. I, I think quite a unique part of what, what Graphene at Manchester offers as well, especially the geek. Um, while we're waiting for any more questions, I've just sent a form in the chat. If you can all open the chat and see there's a form. If you don't mind, please click that link and give us your feedback uh, and you can request a copy of the slides or a copy of the video or even just some more basic graphene uh, kind of knowledge as well that we can send out. So please do click that link, put your feedback uh, and we'll, send, we'll follow that up in the next few days. Um, thanks, for, thanks very much. Uh, I've not seen any. Is Adrian unmuted? Adrian, have you got a question? Yeah, quick question. Thanks, James. That was really interesting. Um, you mentioned about the uh, the impact of COVID. Are you seeing any of the new normal sort of crystallising, or do you think we'll go back to the old ways of working? Um, so, I mean, my at the moment we're still. If I use our analogy, we're still in what we call our red phase of operation, which is very limited. You know two and a half meter spacing, PPE, you know, very limited numbers around. Our next phase is what we call our amber phase, which is 
um, um, some office-based people returning, but generally office-based people continue work from home. What we call our green phase of normal operation, um, to answer your question, I don't think we'll ever go back to how we were before. Mm. I think we'll probably adopt what I call a hybrid. You know, the example I gave today for me personally, uh, I would have spent two or three days on a plane to fly out to Abu Dhabi. You know, I could not have then gone to Coventry and then on to Manchester. So I think there still will be face-to-face. -face. I think we need that face-to-face. -face. We're missing the face-to-face. -face. Uh, yesterday, I went into the Geek for the first time after four months, and it was fantastic to be there. I was only there for an hour, but I spent three hours on the road. Um, I don't know if it's near where you are, but at the moment, I think the road network have decided to do roadworks on every motorway, everybody roundabout in Manchester, M56, M62. So if we had normal level of traffic, it would take me six hours, I think, to get to Manchester from, from North Wales. So to answer your question, I'm seeing some normality in terms of operations, but I don't think we'll ever get back to where we were before. But I think we might adopt, in my language, the benefits of both. Let's do the operations where we can. But let's also exploit this new innovation yeah. model. Um, the company I referred to, you know, LinkedIn comment through to a week later, had the first call a week later, the second call, a week later, a brainstorm, a week later to finalize the contract. Normally, we would still be arranging the first meeting for a face-to-face -face visit in Manchester. So, so, so for me, I think we'll adopt some learning, but I think we really are missing that face-to-face -face contact and some of the things that we normally do. So I think it'll take a bit of time to get back to normal. In my head, I think it's going to take months and year. I don't see a vaccine immediate, so I think we're going to adopt but I think there's some positives that we're taking from this way of working. Yeah, yeah, Jason and I were having a conversation on LinkedIn earlier about when we think we might get back into the geek, uh, but I think it might be some time yet. Yeah, so at the moment, our Rambo phase, we're planning around September, which is limited. So that would include you know, some limited you know, meetings face-to-face, -face, but it'd be more than one-to-one -one rather than the 10 or the 25. So our priority will be keeping... Um, uh, prior to we're keeping the labs de-risked so we're very careful about not mixing any bubbles so we're not using meeting rooms i mentioned the minister visit you know they'll be in a bubble i'm going to be in that bubble but i'm not going to interact with any of the core team again this is where innovation comes from normally when a minister comes in we would introduce them to um some of our team we're still going to do that but they're going to introduce the team via zoom um i don't know how that's going to work it's not ideal but for me it's a lower risk than risking contamination. Okay. Oh, good luck at that. Here's Adrian. A question from Jason Tang from um, Potter Clarkson. Yeah, um, James, it's interesting that you spoke about the face-to-face -face contact. I mean, what I was curious about was now, now that the Geek has been open for a year and a half now, what, what has been the feedback like from the various partners in terms of being in the same building with other companies, other people? Because it's like, a, obviously, previously, before the geek, everybody was in their own locations, but being in the same building, ha have you gotten any positive feedback about in terms of learning from each other and so on and collaboration? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point, Jay. We've actually just come from what we call a technology advisory board. So that was one of the, the subjects we just talked about. Um, the Geek model was very much built on face-to-face -face collaboration. So it's a good point you've raised here. And I must admit, I had a worry when we had the lockdown that we would lose that. I think we have kept some of it through Zoom and web and these webinars are being quite core cool to that. But part of the model that we're really missing at the moment is almost, uh, I use the example of yourself and Adrian. Just by being there, I would just you know, bump into you and catch up with you. Yeah. So we're missing that part, and that's a key element of, for me, the Manchester model. Yes, you can do a webinar, and you can do Zoom, and you can catch up. Well, a lot of it was the informal catch up, and also, I call it the ad hoc catch up. You know, I, I know in your instance, we've been talking with a partner. Actually, you came up in one of the conversations that one of the partner wanted to do something. You were in there. They talked to you. You gave them yeah. advice, yeah. and you know, you and that happened because you were there. Yeah. Um, if, if you weren't there, I'm not sure whether they would have done that. I, I, I don't know. So it's something that I hope we do get back to sooner rather than later. But my answer, I think, is it will be a hybrid. So I think we're going to have to just, I call the word choreograph it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So manage how we get those interactions face to face rather than almost you turn up every day and expect everybody to be there. 
it might be slightly more managed going forward, certainly in the short term. No, thank you. I think it, what you guys have done a really good job in keeping up the momentum. And actually, if what we can learn from this is that, like you say, it's a hybrid model. It's going to be a combination of face-to-face -face contact, but also Zoom meetings and so on. I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to keep up, essentially, that feel of community among the various partners in, in the Geek. No, no, absolutely key. And, and again, for, for all of our partners of the Geek, we're also looking at other tools like Slack, as an example. Mm. You know, um, so again, anyone who's on the, on, on the call who is a partner, thank you. Anyone who's interested in a partner, please contact myself or Nick, uh, the host here, about talking about the partnership model. And if that's from industry through to, you know, we want to expand our network. So again, keen to talk to people who are interested in either joining or engaging going forward. All right, thank you, James. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, James. Um, we've, we've come to the end of the hour. If, if anyone has any burning questions, do, do speak up now, but if not, we'll end it. Um, I just quickly as well remind you the next public webinar like this one is on the 27th of August at 3.30. That's a Thursday again. Um, please visit our LinkedIn page to sign up for that or, or keep a lookout on social media and you should see it. But hopefully see you all then. And for our geek partners, we've of course got many internal webinars coming up. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Um, I think we'll leave it there then. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks very much, James. Anything you want to add, James? Or just... Thanks, people. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate everyone joining in and um, hope you found that of value. But any questions, feedback to myself or, or, or to Nick you know, going forward, thank you. Yep, or use the survey as well. It's in the chat. All right, thanks, everyone. We'll end it there and have a good, good rest of your Thursday.